Today I'm joined by Eamon Ryan. This is a last minute uh, arranged interview, so I'm very grateful to you, Eamon, for agreeing to do this. How are you doing? Good, good to talk to you, Fergus. You're, you're on a train there. What's your, what are you doing at the moment? I'm coming back up from Cork. We launched our five candidates in Cork this afternoon while we had a press conference. So I'm coming back up to Dublin to get ready for uh, environmental hustings tonight. So it's just a lovely two and a half hour gap in the middle of the day. <laughs> You don't get much time just to sit back and relax. So no. that's what I'm doing. I'm trained. And are you on your own or do you have a bit of a team with you there? I've got five security guards <laughs> keeping an eye on everyone, everyone move around me. No, okay. I'm on my own. I'm, okay. I'm, 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 I'm picking up my bike at Houston Station. It's business as usual. Well, Eamon, I want to read something to you because it pertains to a position that you might be in quite soon. So. On the 28th of May in 2007, Kieran Cuff wrote on his blog, let's be clear, a deal with Fianna Fáil would be a deal with the devil. We would be spat out after five years and decimated as a party. But would it be worth it? Question mark. And you were there in 2007 and until 2011 in that government and the party was decimated as he foresaw and and that must have been a pretty traumatizing experience so is there a bit of a deja vu at the back of your mind saying geez we might go in as as minority partners but not really get to have the say that that you think you deserve i don't to be honest i i don't think of it that way in terms of it's not a career choice there's no certainty you're not there to just fill in the years, you're there to try and affect change. And mm -hmm. my experience, you can do that in government. So as difficult as it is, it's worth trying. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, no, it, that, and it kind of cures you of the, oh God, I, I'd love to get to that level. Having been there, there's no real personal ambition process in it because you've done it already. Yes. But there is ambition for the country and that's what drives me. And you seem to, hold a genuine optimism uh, about the sophistication of the Irish people's ability to kind of think ahead that maybe other politicians might think more in the short term. Is that fair to say you you take a kind of a, a wider look at things? I try to and you'd need to after we work in 30 years on the agenda we have without making the sort of progress we need. Um, but I think I'm confident because I think there's been a change in the last year or two all over the world, consciousness about this crisis, climate crisis in front of us. People can see it happening now with Australia burning and um, with greater, more stormy weather coming our way. So I think that's translating into a much more ambitious Irish people in terms of adopting this green agenda. Yeah. Um, so therefore, that's what's, that's what's changing it. It's, it doesn't really relate to ourselves. It relates to people hearing from their student strikes here, that's had a huge influence. And people of all ages responded to say, oh, yeah, we want to play our part. Mm. And it it must be said, green support is uh, substantial in Dublin Bay South, for example. It's pretty big in Dunleary. These are middle class areas, aren't they? And the Greens don't enjoy that same attention in uh, maybe more rural areas or more working class areas. So. How do you try to convince people uh, in, the, in the less sympathetic areas? Because they see, they hear a carbon tax and the, the alarm goes off, you know, and and they hear talk of raw transport but or public transport, but they don't see that as realistic in their, in their situation. So you must come into contact with, with that kind of resistance all the time. Yeah, I think one of the approaches you take is, is you listen to people. You ask for help rather than telling them what to do. You yes. admit that you don't know everything in terms of this change is going to have to come bottom up as well as top down. And uh, and you you have people in every area coming from that area to be, this has to be inclusive. This won't work if it's a device of either left, right, or urban, rural, or young versus old, or some areas versus other areas. Yes. It'll only, I mean, an example in American politics, the way they approach climate is not working. Same in Australia. So I think our role is to try and pull people together. To, this belongs to everyone. It's every place matters, and I think we're starting to broaden that base. It's, it's uh, that's our that's our whole goal, and it'll take time. 
But I think sometimes you start it by listening and taking your time, you get there quicker. And a big, a big group who are probably quick to uh, throw the Eamon Ryan leaflet in the bin would be farmers. So, uh, is are there any farmers that you have managed to convince? Like, or how? Do they, do they believe you when you say we're going to get the good price of beef and, and all that, we're going to protect you? Like, a lot of people don't really buy that. So uh, how do you face that objection? Well, I I that too, but, but no one's buying the alternative. Like, the status quo is not, no one's buying that because prices yeah. are, we're getting a commodity price uh, for, and we're trading on an origin green brand, but we're not getting a premium for it. So, I find increasingly farmers are actually waking up and saying, Do you know really? what, that greens are right. And that kind of old simple narrative of farmers versus greens, that has to go because they're yeah. going to be the front line making the changes we need to make. And, and that's what I seek to encourage and explain. So is, is this election, do you really feel a turning point in, let's call it that narrative, the, the old way of looking at, at green issues? Do you, do you think this is a unique time? I hope so. I mean, I've been thinking that for 30 years. And we thought that in the late 80s, early 90s. We signed the Rio Declaration. That was a turning point. Didn't quite turn out. We thought that when Al Gore came out with his Inconvenient Truth 2005. And while there was a short term rise, the tide went out again. The tide is back in stronger and higher now than ever before. But it really does need to be turning into wholesale change, not just here, but everywhere. And. Um, that's why we're, that's our message in this election. This next decade is critical. We can and will be climate leaders, not laggards. We have to start on the right path. And if people think that, vote green. And, and I think that's starting to resonate. I, I, I think we may surprise people how well we do in this election. So you, you've been at the leaders' debates. Uh, there was one, I think, with seven or eight of you with Claire Byrne. Is that correct? Was there seven or eight of you? There were seven of us. Seven of you. And I remember uh, four years ago you took RT to court because you actually didn't get a say. So you're being taken a bit more seriously this time around. But I don't think you got enough time maybe to make the case about uh, what what you see as the big issue at the moment. Like, what was that debate like from, from your perspective? The, the one with Claire Brown specifically? Tough with respect. I mean, to be honest, in the first half an hour was mainly fighting between some of the other parties and I didn't thought to myself, well, this, do I want to add to that or, or, or bide your time and, and then explain what you're about in a more calmer environment? And, and I chose the latter. Um, but I think we have to be involved in every debate and on every issue. You can't separate out, like housing is connected to transport, it's connected to climate, it's connected to quality of life. Same with health, same with education. So. Um, we're, we're in every debate this election in the way we haven't been before. That, those leaders' debates were a bit messy. I was glad to get the chance to make my point. And yeah. But I'm here. In Asia, but I'm here. So I'm, I'm kind of, we're going to stay the course for the next four or five days and, and see what happens on election day. And it, it seemed, again, I'm following from a distance. I'm literally thousands of miles away. So I, I'm not as in tune as I would have been the last time around. But it seems that uh, Sinn Féin are being taken far more seriously in the last few days than before. Do you see them as... Uh, I, I, have to, I have to go, Fergus. I'm, I've been asked to uh, uh, turn down the headphones. Sorry, my bad. Right. Eamon, thanks for talking to me anyway. Good luck with the election. Thank you, Fergus. Talk to you now. <laughs> So as you heard there, Eamon was unable to answer my last question about going into government with Sinn Féin. We'll find out what happens this Saturday and in the days following that in Ireland's general election 2020.